thanks for inviting me here today. I really appreciate this opportunity to come to this important forum to exchange ideas and science and concerns about asbestos and our opportunities to advance public health with respect to asbestos and protecting individuals throughout the United States and the world from asbestos-related disease. And certainly, um, opportunity to follow my distinguished colleague, Dr. Lemon, who preceded me in the public health service and also at NIOSH. And uh, for me, I was drawn into the world of asbestos in um, 1999 with a little town in Montana called Libby, Montana. Um, and unbeknownst to, to me, a newspaper report that uh, drew me from the public health service and my colleagues from EPA up to Libby, Montana to uh, begin a world of uh, work on asbestos and environmental issues surrounding asbestos that uh, really have consumed my life and certainly uh, many individuals who continue to work on the Libby, Montana site. Um, just for a little bit of overview, there's really two families of asbestos. Um, the one that we're mostly seeing in the product world that Dr. Lemon was talking about is the chrysotile asbestos, um, but also we have the world of amphibole asbestos, which um, a number of uh, forms are regulated. These these two here are more closely related to that which we see in Libby. Um, the amphibole asbestos tends to be these kind of straight linear um, particles of asbestos versus the chrysotile is kind of a curve, curly form of, uh, of a mineral fiber that's persistent and causes the asbestos diseases. Now mineralogically we just talked about ones that are commercially used and have been regulated by countries like the United States. Um, there's another element to what is regulated with respect to asbestos, and that is the, the, sh the shape or the morphology. So not in, in addition to the mineral form, um, there are regulations have to do with the size of the asbestos or what it looks like under a microscope. And we deal with um, optical microscopes, and it's called in here, it's you know, terms called PCM, or phase contrast microscopy. So essentially the rules say you can, these forms of asbestos, those minerals that I talked about, serpentine or amphibole, and these, and these particles or mineral particles that you can see under a microscope that fit into this world are those things that we outlaw. But actually, there's a whole number of mineral particles that we don't see with that optical microscope, and it creates a, a tremendous problem when we get into the environment. Um, so here's things, this is a transmission electron microscope. You can see all of this. So this is a really high intensity microscope. You can see things much smaller than you can see with an optical microscope. So when, when we get into a home or you get into the environment, we have all of this that we can see using a better microscope. Let's say this is the world even that a, a better microscope doesn't see. But here would be what we can see, and this is what our regulations and our epidemiologic studies count. So we're in really in a bit of a dilemma because between the occupational health world and trying to translate that to the environmental health world, so here in the kind of the regulated forms of minerals would be here in the occupational world, the regulated minerals, the regulated sizes. We have all this other stuff out here that causes asbestos-related disease. It could be fibers that are too thin to be seen with an optical microscope or things like arionite or other amphiboles that aren't right currently being regulated. Some of that which may be seen in Libby and other places um, may fit broadly or more smaller ways into these categories and it's a very large problem that we are faced with today in terms of our current regulations and our science and our risk assessment and epidemiology. There's four major forms of the world of an, kind of environmental sources for exposure, and a lot of it comes from the occupational world, as Dr. Lemon was going through, the asbestos-containing materials. Certainly, we get domestic exposure from workers, and as, as Dr. Lemon mentioned, the gentleman didn't go to work to die. Also, he didn't go to work to take material home to his family for family members to die, and we see a lot of that as well. There'll be domestic exposure mining areas and industrial pollution, people that live around those areas, and then the disturbance of naturally occurring NOA, naturally occurring asbestos and contaminated soils. And we'll kind of go through some of these. It's really a bio-persistent poison that we're putting into our atmosphere and our environment from all of these, all of these um, pathways. 
and uh, continuing to raise our exposures throughout the world. This is a picture here of the dry mill in Libby when it was operating. Asbestos containing materials from, as, as Dr. Lemon mentioned, have a number and have been used for years and years in various products. One of the big issues is what's the environmental fate, not just to the workers that are working in it, but where do they go? You know, disposal, demolition. Here's the World Trade Center. Obviously, with asbestos being released that was in those, in those materials. Certainly, the groups of workers have been at risk, but what about residents, people that live around these areas, people that may be exposed to contamination uh, of their, of their con environment? And here's a situation that we're dealing with now in EPA, um, and this is becoming more frequent, is here was an um, old barracks. These are old military facilities. This one's at Northridge Estates in, in, in Oregon. We also have a situation like this in uh, Denver, Colorado where the asbestos was essentially, they just, they just uh, demolished these old barracks and, and became um, kind of put into the, into the land. It was, it was just essentially just tilled into the earth. And then they came and put a development in, and the people lived here, and they started seeing this stuff coming up through the ground. And their kids are there playing, and uh, EPA was called out and say, hey, this is all this asbestos-containing material it keeps coming up and heaving out Every time it frosts, we keep coming out into the ground. Eventually, they had to take these properties and essentially relocate these individuals because we couldn't keep clearing it, kept coming up from the ground for years and years. We're seeing this all over the country. Vermiculite insulation, one of the products that certainly is, um, uh, that we've been intimately involved with with, with um, Montana, with the Libby Mint situation. This was used in attics throughout the country. It has small amounts of asbestos in it, and this was used in the, Here's a picture of Danny Kay being used to advocate the use of, uh, of uh, zonalite attic insulation, which was filled with a small amount of asbestos. And in the country, asbestos-containing material, at least for EPA, is that which has greater than 1%. It could either be, you can, you can have something that has contamination of asbestos, or they use less than 1%. They didn't have to call it asbestos-containing material. But these materials are still very dangerous. They release a lot of asbestos when they're disturbed. Estimates range between 10 to 35 million homes may have vermiculite insulation in it. Domestic exposure from workers. Certainly we see elevated rates of mesothelioma in, in people that lived with workers it's throughout the world. It's well documented. In studies done by Mount Sinai of, of families of workers that dealt with amosite insulation in Patterson, New Jersey, they looked at 626 household contacts. About 35% of them have asbestos-related chest abnormalities. A lot of these family members, uh, the, a lot of these uh, family members, the workers had very limited expo exposure. There, a lot of them worked there for less than 40% worked there for less than one year. Some of these individuals, they looked at 33 people that had moved into a house or were born into a house after the worker no longer worked there, suggesting that disease that occurred in these individuals was due to the residual asbestos that was in the household dust. That's a very important telling point. These are not high dose exposures. These are not high level exposures that we see in workers. These are individuals getting disease from what would be considered pretty low level situations. Shipyard workers also have been, in, uh, the family members of shipyard workers are certainly have been documented as well to have asbestos related disease. How about living near mines? Um, one of the ones that have been studied is Whitnum Mine in Australia, where they have chrysotelite. Some of the individuals that lived around there had exposures that were less than uh, a year, five cases, had developed mesothelioma, lived around that mine for less than a year, never worked there, just lived there. One person didn't even move into that area until after the mine was closed. Again, it's speaking to residual contamination, getting into the environment, causing disease. Same thing with Libby. We see high levels of mesothelioma, plus we have very high levels of x-ray, of chest abnormalities in the population. 18 plus percent of individuals that were tested have chest x-rays that are abnormal in Libby. Other studies also show the same thing in South Africa, chrysotelite, mesothelioma cases around the chrysotile mines in Quebec, um, quarry workers, or, or people that live around the quarries in Italy. Some of the pathways, at least for Libby, that living near a mine included a number of things. You had people, certainly family contact, you had concerns of ambient air. People played in piles. The they, they school areas, the running track, has asbestos contamination that actually had 
some sampling was done, home insulation, garden use, it's used in driveways, people popped it on their stoves, the vermiculite was kind of fun to play with and you can expand it, so you could pop it on your stoves. One of the concerns right now is we're seeing elevated concentrations in tree bark. A number of folks have, have been identified with disease were loggers in the Libby area who basically were cutting trees and they used to talk about seeing the crystalline uh, particles in the air when they would cut the trees down and then how their, how their chains would go, uh, would go essentially bald or, or wear down quickly because of, this, because of the asbestos coating on the trees. Living near processing facilities is well documented. Monferrato, Italy, um, working around asbestos cement factory here in Mansville, New Jersey. Um, a study that was done in three countries, Italy, Spain, and Switzerland, showed that your risk of living near, your risk of mesothelioma was, uh, was increased by, by your proximity to those facilities. We have Libby Sisters, um, which are essentially processing facilities that obtained vermiculite from Libby at over 300 locations uh, within the United States. There was a picture of a facility in, in Minneapolis where children were playing on piles of material that was essentially the, uh, the waste material that was put out in front. This is a residential neighborhood. We have a case of an individual who played there for a couple of years, lived near the valley in the neighborhood, who died at age 42 of lung cancer and asbestosis, just having played in these piles for a couple of years of his life when he was a child. Over 300 places throughout the United States. What is naturally occurring asbestos? Well, it's, it's that which occurs essentially, all asbestos is natural, but uh, the term essentially referring to that which is still kind of in its native natural state. California state rock is serpentine. That's how much is, uh, material that they have in California that could bear asbestos type fibers. Uh, 44 of 58 counties um, have serpentine. Um, and the asbestos fibers can be released from some of these, not all of these deposits, uh, when they're disturbed. It's certainly of large concern. We've shown throughout the world that disturbance of these, these contaminated soils or these natural deposits have resulted in disease. In Turkey, they've shown uh, tremolite uh, in central Turkey and Anatolia, both from arianite, which is another substance uh, similar to asbestos, to zeolite. Um, we also have tremolite and actinolite have all shown elevated rates of mesothelioma. New Caledonia, northeast Corsica with chrysotile, uh, chrysotilite in China, uh, tremolite in Metsova, Greece. All shown that people working, uh, living around these areas have elevated rates of mesothelioma. Some of the pathways in which they may be getting their exposures, you know, working in fields, whitewashing is a big one, or plastering of walls with this, this kind of, what's called uh, Poe, I guess, this is a whitewash, the tremolite that was used essentially for walls and, and also used in powder, powder, uh, pottery and even reports of baby powder being used with this tremolytic talx. What about the United States? What about disturbance of naturally occurring areas in the United States becoming more of a, uh, of a larger issue, especially as we begin to develop areas um, in places that have asbestiform deposits? El Dorado, California is one that's been controversial lately. EPA is working on that. Um, actinolite asbestos and other amphiboles. Uh, Clear Creek management areas, a chrysotile deposit in California. There's an area of arianite right now in Dunn County, North Dakota, which they've used arianite for road paving. Um, Fairfax County, Virginia has a lot of asbestos. Here's a picture, about 11 square miles of kind of asbestos deposits within Fairfax County, Virginia. Uh, Swift Creek in Watton County, Washington has a large chrysotile deposit that's coming down into, uh, into contact with humans. The Clear Creek management area is an interesting case. No, this is one, this was the Atlas mine. It was a large chrysotile mine that operated in the United States and this Clear Creek management area is kind of a recreational area nearby. It has large um, chrysotile concentrations. And right here, this is a, an ATV bike road, essentially. This is being used, this area, for recreation. So people are out there and they're, and they're driving around. This is you know, all filled with chrysotile asbestos, essentially. Here's a child who rides her bike with her family and rides around this area and it's being managed by the Bureau of Land Management. So EPA went out and did some, some evaluation to see if the asbestos is being kicked up or people are being exposed. So there's you know, EPA type folks on uh, motorcycles and uh, ATVs, and we're going to get some measurements to see if we get exposures doing what people are doing in this area. 
see if there's a risk. So um, here's the OSHA standard, and here's the, the results of asbestos concentrations. This is if you're the lead motorcycle or SUV, and these are people behind. Uh, you can see these concentrations of exposure are well above what we would consider anything close to being safe. Um, certainly pays to be in the lead, I guess. But um, certainly any type of uh, activities in these naturally occurring areas. One of the things that we found when we started working on Libby, which is particularly problematic, is that the assessment of, of asbestos in soils or, or asbestos-containing materials is extremely problematic. Our, our ability to analyze these materials with respect to asbestos concentrations below 1% are very limited. You just don't see it. However, it has nothing to do with meaning it's safe. People somehow assume that 1% or these low concentrations are somehow inherently safe. It's exactly not true at all. We haven't found that if you disturb these materials, like the vermiculite attic insulation or things that have, may have well less than 1%, or you can't even see it. Some of these soils will be non-detect. You go and do disturbance on them, you'll get airborne exposures which are extremely high. So people's exposures are, are particularly of public health concern. So we call it this pig pen effect. Really, it's what you do. It's these disturbance activities which release asbestos to the air and give you an exposure. How do you control for this? Here's El Dorado Hills, California, where a lot of the uh, soil, soil measurements basically show low asbestos or no asbestos. So EPA did some you know, digging in soil like kids with, with pails and things along those lines. Rode bicycles up and down. Uh, baseball, worked in the fields and playgrounds to try to see if you know, what kind of stuff was come up in the air, what people do. Um, even to the extent of playing hopscotch. Now this one I think is particularly uh, entertaining. But um, essentially found that the, the results could be pretty high. And you could see pretty high fiber exposures. Um, especially compared to background. So there are exposures, being, there are fibers being released through all these activities in these areas and people are being exposed. And the public health consequences and issues are of great concern. So is, is naturally occurring asbestos in the United States, is it safe? Well, it's certainly we're, we're struggling with this. It's certainly if you're not exposed to it, it's in a remote area, probably not a problem. However, if you are building or doing activities, residential or commercial activities, in these areas, there's a potential for very large and problematic exposures. There was a study done by, um, by PAN um, that basically looked at mesothelioma cases in California. And they found that as your, your risk of mesothelioma decreased for about 6.3% uh, for every 10 kilometers away from an asbestos source, and they accounted for age, sex, and occupational exposure. It's a really interesting study. It correlates kind of like living around the industrial area. So essentially, if you live by these naturally occurring areas, your risk for mesothelioma certainly increases. And I'll close with this. Certainly, the, it's kind of in the summary, uh, environmental asbestos exposures are routinely resulting in disease throughout the world and have been from a number of sources for a long, long time. The airborne concentrations are highly dependent on activities. And even what would be considered low, low contamination levels can be extremely dangerous. Our current analytical tools and risk assessment models and regulations are inadequate to address the environmental issues. They're really an adaptation from the occupational health world and are insufficient. Anyways, thank you very much. I appreciate this opportunity.